Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. We're really happy that we are still here after 20 years. We love showcasing local artists from our community. Everyone picked up very quickly on the importance of it. Today on Spotlight, giving new writers a voice by putting their play on stage. Plus, why a WashU study says sleeping can slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And then local artists with unique abstract pieces, why some of these works feel ancient and brand new. But first, we'll take you on a private tour of the Missouri Botanical Garden. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. Welcome to the Jack C. Taylor Visitor Center. It's quite spectacular. It is a, an extraordinary building and we're really proud of all that's been achieved with this wonderful building for the garden and for St. Louis. The $100 million Jack C. Taylor Visitor Center is far more than just a new entrance. Here, technology and nature work in harmony to create a visitor experience more accessible, sustainable, and practical than ever before. Why was there a need to replace the Ridgeway Center? The building itself was not performing well and was coming to the end of its useful life. Sometimes it's better just to start again and do something that is really going to be a world-class center as this is. What is this, I guess it's a sculpture you would call it above our heads? Yes, it is, and this is an area that we call the Lantern uh, over the William T. Kemper lobby, and it has a, uh, a series of screens that reflect the view of dappled light coming through a woodland canopy. The floor is very interesting. It is. A lot of work and thought went into creating this, uh, this floor with uh, the brass leaves from selected native trees from Missouri uh, were reproduced from our collections. Uh, the actual leaves were then copied and cut out in brass and put into this floor amongst cut river pebbles. And you can see the tulip tree and you can see an elm and the liquid amber and the sassafras and ash trees and chestnuts. So there are about 20 native Missourian tree species that are represented on this floor. This is a very large video screen, which we can use to, to talk about what's happening at the garden, to introduce people to some of the activities that are going on at any particular time. In planting new gardens around the center, we wanted to make sure that we brought something new to the garden. So by and large, the species that we are including and have included and will include in those planting beds are new to the garden. They're also new to St. Louis. We have wanted to make sure that this building has many different plant elements brought into it. This is a log bench created by a craftsman in, in Missouri using a tree that was close to the end of its life in the garden on the footprint of the new center. And we thought how nice it would be to use this and give it some immortality. We have in the Sassafras restaurant created a whole series of panels that reflect different aspects of the garden's work with plants. They feature different subjects laid out in the most wonderful geometric and uh, artistic patterns. From overhead to underfoot, sustainability is an important feature of the new visitor center. The roof is covered with solar panels. Its extensive stormwater collection system is being used to hydrate the landscaping. And in the parking lot, the garden has added additional vehicle charging stations. One of the most striking features of the new visitor center is the Emerson Conservatory, a vast improvement over the floral display hall at the Ridgeway Center. 
In the Ridgeway Centre, we had a large box-like structure where we would have the gardens, orchid show, and the holiday flower and train show, and some meetings. It had dreadful acoustics. It also was a really bad space to grow plants. We couldn't leave anything in there for too long because the plants would start to die. It just didn't have enough light whereas a new conservatory is designed for perfect growing space for exotic plants. But perhaps the biggest change from the previous visitor center is the addition of a dedicated event center. The event center provides us with a dedicated space where we can have all of these meetings and, and activities with its own entrance. We can also use it for uh, the ways in which many people enjoy the garden, which is to make the garden part of their family special celebration. This building has been funded entirely from private donations in St. Louis. Everyone picked up very quickly on the importance of it. Everyone knows that the Missouri Botanical Garden is a world-class institution and has a huge reputation around the world. But we didn't have a world-class entry for it, and we do now. See the full HEC exclusive film and tour on Spotlight. July 9th at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Santa calls me at the office out of the blue. I remember the story. Our radio broadcast for three years wasn't entirely fictitious. Pop killed him. Oh. Back when first run started, it was felt that in the St. Louis region there were a lot of active interest in playwriting and but there's never anywhere to see your things put on because people will go and see Shakespeare or a lot of different playwrights over and over again but to take the chance on putting on a new play uh, most theatre companies can't do that for various reasons so it was thought well let's have a, a group that that's all we do we'll just put on first runs. First run was started by Dr. Don Weiss, who was trained as a psychologist, and he also became a writer, an entrepreneur, and also a playwright. He wanted to see his work done. Nobody puts on new plays, period, especially at this time, which is about, uh, say, 2001 or so. And the whole point of First Run Theatre was to produce new, unpublished, unproduced regional playwrights. What is it? Guacamole milkshakes. <laughs> I'm Ugh. serving them tonight at the slumber party. Did you say guacamole? Did you say slumber party? Oh, we're so excited. We're going to be. I think it's really important to give new writers a voice and an opportunity to see their work performed on stage, whether it's a staged reading or a fully mounted production. I mean, there's probably nothing more valuable for a writer than to see how their script works on stage. I sent my piece in. Yeah, I mean, it was hot off the presses and I wanted to hear it, I wanted to see it. And thank goodness, because there is this wonderful, important developmental space for local writers. I mean, here's the thing, there's the writing, there's the sharing, and then there's the rewriting. And you can't rewrite until you really hear it. You really need to see how it lands. I trust you, and I need you to do this for me, for, for us. I know it seems strange. To say the least. <laughs> New plays are submitted to us. Uh, we do not ask for them. We just say we are open to submissions. Just go ahead, send them in, and we look for three different type of plays. A full-length play, two act one that'll last uh, a full evening's performance, one act, which is generally about 35 minutes to an hour, and the 10-minute play, and we have a whole festival devoted to the short plays that we do once a year. A place like First Run is a kind of artistic family. Not only does it offer opportunities for playwrights and directors, but also you have to have actors. 
who will read the work and bring it to life. So it's a place that, that younger, less experienced actors can come, but it's also a place where some people who have a lot of time on the stage come. As an actor, you're pretty well guaranteed that this show's never been done before. And that's pretty cool because you can step into a fresh role, interpret it completely, you know, for the first time, pretty much lay the groundwork for that, that play and that role. The difference between working on an established play and something from a brand new playwright from a director's standpoint, it's very different. Something brand new, you don't have that backstory and you have to work with the playwright, work with the actors to find out what is this about and how do we communicate that to the audience in the best possible way. We're really happy that we are still here after 20 years. You know, there's obviously been some bumps in the road, but we're still here. So we're happy to be able to celebrate with actors and directors, anybody that's been involved with First Run and that have enjoyed what we have done. It's quite a leap of faith to come and see a playwright that you don't know, probably. You know, there's a lot of wonderful theatre in St. Louis, so to choose to actually come to one of these events is quite a step. But we would like the audience to go away with a fresh understanding of the vast talent that's out there in the country and to perhaps, you know, give these people a chance. This is theatre. We're rehearsing a play. This is not real. <laughs> With every stroke of the bow, every stroke of the brush, with every stroke of genius, the arts make life in St. Louis richer, not just emotionally, but also economically. In our region, the arts create almost $600 million a year in economic activity, supporting more than 19,000 jobs, generating almost $60 million for state and local governments, with almost 12 million annual arts-related visits. That's more than all St. Louis sporting events combined. Whether in a park, on a street, or a wall, experimental or a classic, the arts deserve our support because the arts help support us. HEC Media is proud to be our region's home for arts, education, and culture. Because in St. Louis, the arts mean business. Neuroscientists are learning more about Alzheimer's disease and possible treatments through extensive research. They're examining prevention strategies and treatments to slow, stop, and reverse damage in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. One idea that hints at preventing Alzheimer's symptoms and slowing disease progression has to do with a particular medication for insomnia. A sleeping pill may reduce the toxic buildup of Alzheimer's proteins in the brain, both tau proteins and amyloid beta proteins. Use of a particular sleeping pill is explored by Dr. Brendan Lucy, Associate Professor of Neurology at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, and he's the director of Washington University's Sleep Medicine Center. The title of my study was Suvorexant Acutely Decreases Tau Phosphorylation and Amyloid Beta in the Human Central Nervous System. So there's been evidence in mice that a class of drugs called dual orexin receptor antagonists, which block a protein called orexin in the brain, lower the amyloid beta concentrations in the fluid around the brain of the mice, as well as the accumulation of the amyloid uh, in the brain itself. So Dr. Lucy took the next step, a human study. The purpose of the study was to do a direct translation of that finding, meaning we wanted to take what had been found in mice and see if we see the same thing in humans. The small proof of concept study had 38 volunteers. Individuals who are cognitively unimpaired, meaning there was no problems with their memory or thinking. Um, we were looking for individuals who are 45 to 65 years of age and who had some evidence of sleep problems. We brought them into a research unit we have here at Washington University and we placed a little tube, a catheter in their lower back that was able to collect the fluid that's around the brain and the spinal cord 
every two hours. And they were given the drug over two nights, and we sampled this fluid for 36 hours. Lucy found reason to hope compared to participants in the placebo group. Those who received a single high dose of the drug showed a 10 to 15 percent drop of this key form of tau that contributes to tau tangles. Phosphorylated form of tau. When you develop Alzheimer's disease, tau accumulates in neurons and leads to the, to the death of the neurons. Similarly, amyloid beta levels were 10 to 20 percent lower and levels dropped again after a second drug dose. These differences are considered statistically significant. Past studies found links between poor sleep and Alzheimer's disease. The disease involves changes to the brain that disrupt sleep, and poor sleep accelerates harmful changes to the brain, a vicious cycle. Lucy and colleagues were among the first to show in people that poor sleep is linked to higher levels of both amyloid and tau in the brain. So the possibility of the sleeping pill improving health would be ideal. What's really exciting to me about this, this area of, of research is that the drug that we used is, is already approved for insomnia, though. Currently, using sleeping pills to stop or slow progression of the disease is not proven. More research is needed. And it is conceivable with our study that, you know, we see an acute effect, but as the body kind of adjusts to getting the dose of, of Suvorexant or one of these similar drugs every day, that you kind of see a plateau or, or a reduction in the, in the effect size. To get answers, Dr. Lucy is taking the next step, studying longer term effects with older participants. Well, we're looking for older adults, you know, 60 or 65 and older, who are cognitively unimpaired and have evidence of um, increased amyloid in the brain. And then to treat for longer periods of time, you know, months, and, and look to see, are you seeing the same effects in the fluid around the brain? But also we have a study where we're looking to see, is there a change on imaging for, for amyloid after someone's been on uh, Subarexant for, for two years? Hoping for results that may one day become part of a treatment plan for Alzheimer's patients. The St. Louis Holocaust Museum, later on Spotlight. Here at House Gallery, we love showcasing local artists from our community. Right now on display at the gallery, we have Alicia Lachance and Ken Wood. Both of these artists are showcasing 2D media in their unique abstract ways. When you first walk into the gallery, you will see Ken Wood's new exhibit, Bandwidth. These are prints that I've made over the last nine years, uh, mostly working with a fine art printer in St. Louis named Pele Prints, which is run by my good friend Amanda Verbeck. I studied architecture at one point in life, and one of the things I remember an architect saying is that architecture is like frozen music. And I think of that as being something that is both in motion and in stasis at the same time. And I like to think of these prints as the same thing. Uh, so what you see are these large gestures that move across the page, but they're also frozen in time. And so I want to give the sense of both the path of the hand of the artist moving across the page, but also frozen into this composition that is supposed to maintain balance. So a big part of the work is uh, the use of color and the way that color is overlaid. Sometimes we will have a lot of transparency in an ink, and so when it's printed on top of another color, you will see the first color coming through a lot. And we also have a lot of opacity in some of the inks so that they really cover up the previous mark that's on the page. It's always nice to share my art with uh, my friends, my community, my colleagues, and if you're in the Central West End, I hope you'll come down and see my work and the work of the wonderful Alicia Lachance, which is upstairs. The name of this exhibition is The Ornament of Grammar. It's a flip on a book that I had stumbled across called The Grammar of Ornament, written by Owen Jones. He did a survey around the world at the turn of the century on architectural details. I thought it would be interesting to take this notion of language and look at the details of how we perhaps communicate to one another. And with these particular paintings, I decided to also regard them as 21st century meditations of sort 
I'm really fascinated by the idea of the positivity of the notion of a universal language. And of course, with our constant interplay on the internet, I like the idea of being able to respond to a color or a graphic and perhaps having an understanding of an idea that transcends borders, cultures, etc. With the large prints, that's an ambition that I've had for so many years now. With these, I wanted the works to almost feel ancient, at the same time like 21st century meditations. For the last several years, I've largely been working on projects overseas, anywhere from St. Petersburg to Singapore or Macau. And it's been ages since I've had an exhibition in my hometown of St. Louis. Um, so to show with Charlie, who gave me my first shot ever as an artist 20 years ago, and be supported by him, have him believe in the work, it was wonderful. We are very excited to be showcasing both of these artists. The exhibitions will run through July 7th. And for more information, you can visit our website at hauskagallery.com. HEC Media, recognized, celebrated, honored time and again for excellence in the industry. HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. Arts and education to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries, individual craft achievements to overall excellence. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. My mother's early childhood, she had a very close family. She lived in Berlin. She had a younger sister uh, and her two parents. Her grandparents on her mother's side also lived in Berlin in a very beautiful house. They were very influential in the Jewish community in Berlin. This is a photograph of my mother on the right and her sister Vera on the left in 1939. So my mom would have been 12 and Vera would have been 10. And my grandparents, my grandfather Max and my grandmother Adele. And then in 1933, Hitler came to power and life changed very quickly. My grandfather was a judge and so he lost his job within, you know, in my mother's estimation, weeks or a month maybe, because no Jews would be allowed to have any kind of influence in a courtroom. School changed, uh, the flag of Germany changed, the swastika became the flag of Germany. She remembered being outside in a, in a little park as the flag was changing, and she remembers the looks, the looks on her parents' faces and that, that's when she was five. And I think there were fond memories after that, but that was a big turning point. My grandparents were there until March of 1943 when they were deported. They never got, were able to get out of Germany. My mother and her sister were sent to foster, Jewish foster parents in Holland in June of 1939. And my mother didn't go back to Germany, but her younger sister ended up back in Berlin with their parents and was deported with them in March of 1943. She was in six concentration camps. So she was in the first concentration camp in southern Holland. And then she was in Auschwitz-Birkenau and in four other concentration camps kept getting moved and she was doing labor in all of them. But she was with a group called Phillips, the Phillips Group. She was saved by the Phillips Corporation. So Fritz Phillips of the Phillips Corporation, a Dutch corporation, and once Holland was taken over by the Nazis, they had to work for the Nazis. Mr. Phillips set up 
a factory. He went to the Nazis, who were, the Gestapo was running this concentration camp in southern Holland, and he said, let me use Jewish women. They, they have a little more, they have more dexterity in their fingers, which isn't true. Um, but that was believed, the Gestapo believed it, so he had working for him not getting paid, again, it was, it was slave labor and the, and the goods were going to the Nazis, uh, about 800 Jewish women in this concentration camp. And it, it saved her life, even though she wasn't working for them all the way through, because they got extra food, a little bit, you know, a couple hundred calories a day, uh, paid for by Phillips and brought in by Phillips. Uh, they were working inside and they worked a little bit fewer hours. She was liberated just before her 18th birthday. We're gonna walk through the St. Louis Kaplan Feldman Holocaust Museum, and I'll point out a few things that I talk to when I'm taking a group through the museum, because I serve as both a, an educator and as a second generation speaker. Almost everything you see in this museum is anything personal is related to somebody who lived in St. Louis, a survivor who came to St. Louis. So we have around 900 survivors who came to St. Louis after the war. And in this gallery, we have photos of many of them in, with, with their families, at work, through the years, family events. It's, all of this was so important to them. And on this wall, we have a moving list of everybody so we can see everybody's name. It's really, really important to see the names of people. This is a photograph of Gus Schoenfeld. He came to St. Louis after the war. As far as we know, he is the only survivor in this photograph. Gus grew up to become a very prominent doctor here in St. Louis and was on the team uh, that developed the drug Lipitor, which is a cholesterol-lowering drug. The significance of that, besides the millions of lives he helped save, is this is one person who lived. What about the others, the millions and millions of people who, who didn't survive, who were killed, and whose families never grew, and we, we don't know what the world has lost. Next week, a group accurately representing field musicians from the American Civil War. Plus, the artistic director of America's Birthday Parade takes us behind the scenes. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.